Today on CityCast Boise, a mass eviction leads to a lawsuit, Boise State grads get ready to take on the world, and is a political revolution brewing? Our Hey Boise newsletter editor, Blake Hunter, is here to break down the local stories you need to know. It's Friday, May 5th. I'm Frankie Barnhill filling in for Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hey, Blake, happy Friday. Hey, happy Friday. Okay, so I want to start this uh, week's news uh, roundup talking about really a story that is the story of Boise in so many ways these days. (laughs) And that is this, um, this East end apartment mess uh, where these tenants and former tenants of this apartment building, they're suing the property management company, but we have to back up to March when that company uh, called commercial Northwest, they told tenants uh, they had like 30 days to vacate out of nowhere because the heat was broken. What happened? What happened after that point? Okay, so here's the timeline. March 1st, they tell tenants that they have 30 days to get out. Um, yeah, because of that heating thing. Tenants aren't happy about that, obviously. Um, yeah. And then also included in that lawsuit that you mentioned, the um, attorneys are saying that like there was no legal basis for them to even say that. Um, so... That's kind of one of the claims against them. And then on March 9th, um, which was a Thursday, they just rescinded that. And they were like, okay, we're all good. Never mind. Yeah. (laughs) The next day, um, at like after 6 p.m. on a Friday, all the tenants get this email that is like, you have to move out within three days. Um, We just got hurt. We just heard from the contractors working on the building and the complex that the heating's not going to come back on. Like the heating's not going to work. So we can't house you here anymore. You have three days. Um, obviously, again, tenants were super pissed about that. Yeah. And um, then Commercial Northwest, uh, the property manager, said, OK, you can turn in your keys as soon as possible. And pretty much from jump, they were saying, we're going to give everyone their um, all of their security deposits back. We're going to give their, um, I think it was March rent back um, and then help with. It wasn't quite as clear then. We're going to help with uh, finding new housing. So. But I mean, even with that, it's yeah. it's just a pretty wild move. I think it was like 34 apartment units that were kicked out. And, you know, when we talk about the East End in Boise, I think a lot of people think of like big houses on Warm Springs. Right. Million dollar homes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. And that is true. But there are also pockets, especially right in that area, right off Park Center, um, that are actually like pretty low, lower income apartment areas. And so that's kind of like the neighborhood that we're talking about is that this company just basically like booted all of these people out who, yeah, just don't have the cash to just like, OK, I'll just go move into another apartment. Right. They're living in a building that's not that great because they can't afford to live in a better one to start with, which means yeah. that, yeah, they probably don't have like four thousand five thousand dollars on hand to move and find new place and new deposit and all the things that it costs to be a renter exactly and i used to not live in the cambridge square apartments which is where this happened but the apartment apartment complex right next to it one of them um which was kind of like same level of profile and yeah i mean the the tenants have been saying that there were like heating and electricity issues for, I mean, months before this. And I do always remember seeing crews outside, like trying to work on stuff. Um, Hmm. And I know that there were like some Boise State students living there. um, Like I can't imagine being, you know, evicted. Right. And given like three days while you're going to school. But I mean, for anyone, that's a nightmare. Yeah. And I mean, just really fast. I mean, so they're saying like, okay, we, our heat is broken. So get out versus our heat is broken. We're like going to do everything it takes to fix it, to find alternative methods of heating while we fix the main problem. Like that's, that would be the logical thing is fix the problem. How does that mean that you have to kick people out? And they were, you know, couching it as well, it's unsafe because, you know, it's March and it's cold and you don't have heat anymore tenants. So for your own safety, we need you to leave. And I'm very curious about, you know, they said that on Friday and the day before on Thursday, they were like, oh, actually, we were just kidding. You're all good to live here. Don't worry about it. 
Right. So what would have changed yeah. <laughs> for overnight, basically? Um, and yeah, you mentioned that. You, so you've seen the exact building, you know exactly where it is. I went on Google and I was like, oh, I wonder if there's any Google reviews. There was one I found like from two years ago that was outlining, you know, inconsistent heat even then and inconsistent air conditioning, just management company not responding and things like that. And, you know, anyone who's rented uh, in Boise or in Idaho has probably has uh, a horror story or two of their own. Um, and, you know, the question of like what protections are actually there uh, to keep those kind of things from happening is an open one. So, yeah, what what laws do exist to protect renters right now? Yeah, I mean, not a lot. There's um, so I mean, as compared to other states um, for this kind of thing. We saw this legislative session, Senator Ali Robbie's reasonable fees um, bill that basically kind of set parameters on what landlords could or could not um, charge as far as fees go. Um, and that did pass. Um, and then previously, you know, in more recent years, um, former Boise City Council member uh, Lisa Sanchez had like a $30 rental application fee cap. Um, and then the legislature like kind of has moved against that. So our legislature is pretty pretty pro landlord um, in most of these regards, which makes things really difficult if you're a renter. Yeah, and uh, what was interesting about um, Senator Robbie's bill, we talked with her, and she said she actually had a lot of landlord support for her bill. Um, and of course, it did pass in part because you know landlords, ones that are good actors, they don't want to lose tenants because that right. means it's a hassle, it's mm -hmm. such a pain. So there's so many reasons, economic as well as ethical reasons, to not be shady. Uh, but without those real guardrails. Um, you know, people can be bad actors. Uh, we also spoke with someone, I think it was back, oh, January, February, we'll link to it, um, a woman who experienced uh, basically an informal eviction where her heat was turned off in the winter, her AC was turned off in the summer. It was a similar deal where the the individual landlord in that case said, you know, this just isn't safe. It's not good. You guys all need to move out. Uh, after she complained about the fact that her heat didn't work in the cold and her AC wasn't working when it was 100 degrees and more. So what other lo what laws do exist in other states? You mentioned that, you know, Idaho is pretty pro landlord. Um, what in, in more pro renter states, uh, what does it look like? Yeah. So um, there's an Idaho statesman article from Brian Clark in the opinion section that was about you know, in Oregon, Washington, and many other states, um, tenants can withhold rent if their AC isn't working, um, if they kind of provide a statement of like, this is why I'm withholding it. Uh, and that would have been a big cha game changer in this case. Um, and, you know, we'll see how this lawsuit plays out eventually. I'm actually pretty curious because it just seems, like you said earlier, it seems very emblematic of, of Boise's housing situation. But yeah, there, there are several pieces of legislation that maybe could have helped. Yeah. Um, do you have any horror story you want to share about renting? <laughs> um, not really. I mean, my philosophy with renting in Boise that I have learned, and I luckily haven't learned it the hard way, really, is just like assume that your landlord won't help you, um, mm, which is yeah. not great, you know. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, I've really only like requested formally help from any landlord. And, I've you know, I've rented here for five years now. I've only really requested help formally from like a, a commercial property manager like three or four times. And it's just kind of been a disaster every time, you know, um, where it just takes a long time for people to get back to you. Um, it's just like pulling teeth to get anything done. So unfortunately, um, my unsolicited advice is like you kind of have to do it yourself. Um, and, yeah. you know, again, if if we had a slightly different like political cultural around this, then you know, I would feel more comfortable like trying to do repairs and then like deducting, like having my landlord deduct that for my rent kind of thing. But right. I don't even really feel comfortable doing that, to be honest. If it's, you know, like small things, the only thing that in Idaho that you can withhold your rent for is uh, broken smoke detectors uh, or fire detectors. And 
that's so cheap that people mostly just replace that themselves. Yeah. Um, I have one story that I will share without totally naming names, though maybe, I don't know, DM me, maybe I'll tell you, but um, there is a rental property company in town. This is my advice is do your research, yeah. um, is like try to find somebody you know who has rented through a property management company or a particular building before you move in um, and get a sense for it. Um, yeah, I lived in a building where uh, at the end, which is part of the reason why I moved out, and I'm incredibly privileged that I was able to move out, but there were some things, uh, particularly water and some heating issues on and off. And uh, I remember looking up the Idaho Code to go, okay, you know, at what point can I take some legal action or at least like threaten it? Because at this point, I, you know, my water's been off for a couple of days and that's a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, it it definitely can happen. It happened to me. Uh, it's the only time it's happened to me, thankfully. But again, I think for anybody who's in a more marginalized situation or just doesn't know that they have or like their paychecks unsteady. Um, you know, there's so many things you're at a really vulnerable position without those protections. Okay, another thing that happened this week, uh, some news was around this new ballot initiative that would, if it if there's enough signatures and it's it's certified and all that, would be on the ballot in 2024. And it's about primaries and basically our political system currently um, and, and how we vote. Um, Blake, explain this as much as you can. Yeah. So if you don't know what they are, it, it can be kind of confusing, but it, it, this is a pretty big deal. So essentially the goal of the initiative, um, there it's kind of twofold. Um, number one, it will remove closed primaries, which means you know, primaries are the elections before everybody gets to vote. And so that's split off into the Republican Party has a primary. So if this initiative passed, it would completely get rid of that. So um, that just kind of opens up the field to a lot more people. Um, we'll get into what that could mean. The second part of this bill is that it implements uh, ranked choice voting. So um, essentially what that means in most cases is that uh, voters get to rank the people that they want to vote for. In this si certain situation, um, it's just you get to pick who your number one person is, say out of a pool of four people. Uh, you get to pick who your number one is and you don't rank the other ones. And um, basically, you just keep going doing that until someone wins 50% of the vote. Hmm. Um, and so then it, it kind of turns into runoffs. So that democratic method has been proven to reduce a lot of extremism, um, hmm. which is a big part of why this is uh, being passed around. Um, and I think it's going to be really popular. So we'll, I'm really interested to see how this plays out. Let's talk about the closed primary part just really fast. So because, yeah, it's been uh, the Republicans um, closed their primary like over a decade ago. The Democrats chose not to. And so right now it creates this, you know, situation where if you're in a county, especially where it's like, you know, Republicans are going to win and you don't want to say that you're a Republican, you don't want to register as a Republican, then you can't really participate. Yeah. In, in essence, you de facto, you're not participating at all. Actually, um, Clark Corbin, our, our buddy from the Idaho Capital Sun, wrote an article and he included um, a quote from a former journalist in eastern Idaho, um, which as journalists, uh, a lot of people feel like they can't, you know, register in a particular party because then that's, you know, making it obvious because that's public information um, about their political views. And so in order to stay neutral and um, to try to but still participate as a citizen and be able to vote, she was like, I, I can't participate or, you know, this is really hard. So that's a fascinating element of it. Talk to me, though. You mentioned like you feel like this is going to be popular. Um what makes you think that? Like, what uh, what about the this moment in time um, and what could this result in politically that could get people really excited? And like what what groups are uh, behind this that are right. that feel like they could actually succeed? Yeah. So this is a merging of two kind of major political factions. Um, I mean, and the, that's not super, you know, defined, but. One of the big groups leading this is Reclaim Idaho, which people might recognize from 2018's Medicaid expansion um, ballot initiative, which was extremely popular. And um, last year, they had the Quality Education Act, which didn't actually pass. They pulled that 
from like the ballot initiative process because um, Governor Little and the legislature essentially implemented an education bill that, yeah, they, they wanted credit for that. They didn't initially want to spend that kind of money on education, but they decided to, you know, do what they could to take credit for that. So, and then also on the other hand of this is kind of this old guard of the Republican Party. So um, Bruce Newcomb, who's a former Republican Speaker of the House, um, is kind of being a pretty public figure about this, I think because this whole coalition of people really wants to communicate that there are Republicans involved in this, um, because this uh, is essentially to increase like the feeling that people can actually participate in their democracy. You know, people in Idaho, voters in Idaho, are really, really tired of feeling like they have to be part of the Republican Party to even be part of elections. And um, so I think that that's why it's going to be really popular. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many petition signatures they're going to get. Obviously, Reclaim Idaho and several other groups involved are veterans at this process. They have people all over the state that are ready to go get signatures. So I think it's going to, you know, they're going to do well there. Um and yeah, I think that we have seen in Idaho the last few years that the biggest um, political pushback against kind of the increase in conservatism in the legislature comes through ballot initiatives. Um, and that is also why the legislature is, um, you know, has in the past few years also tried to push back against that. And people aren't going to be happy about it. Um, already people in my inbox are not happy about it. <laughs> uh, a couple people, um, but mostly people who are writing in uh, from the Hey Boise newsletter are really excited. Yeah, I was curious what kind of vibe you're getting from from our readers so far. I mean, I think this is fascinating on so many levels, kind of building this coalition of traditional Republicans mm -hmm. meets this like uh, Reclaim Idaho, which has like very progressive ideals and has on the ground uh, experience uh, passing initiatives. But, you know, they also they gathered I mean, the Medicaid expansion, of course, that was prior to the legislature making it harder to pass initiatives, as you as you mentioned. So the threshold is higher since the last time Reclaim Idaho has had a successful uh, initiative process. But not as high as it could have been. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> they kind of had a compromise there. So, yeah. yeah, this is so fascinating on so many levels. I mean, it feels revolutionary. Like, is that too much to say if this were to if this were to come to pass? No, I mean, I think that it would really fundamentally change the political landscape in Idaho. I think that this, you know, it's not like there is not going to be an influence of the far right anymore. But essentially what the closed primaries in the Republican Party have been is in, in like a race to prove who can be most conservative mm -hmm. uh, and kind of cater to voters and like the last minute in these uh, in these primaries um, and taking that away from them. I think that we'll actually be able to see kind of a better, a more accurate depiction of like political views in Idaho. We're still going to be a red state. Um, like it's, you know, our legislature is still going to sure. be Republican controlled. Like that's that's not yeah. going to change anytime soon. Um, and there will still be a big shift after this if it happens. Yeah. Um, so they're just at the beginning of the process. Right. Uh, long, long ways to go, but um, another fascinating uh, ballot initiative that's that's being floated. Um, OK, I want to end on, uh, you know, it's always fun this time of year. Um, you know, spring is here and uh, the flowers are out and all of that. But also there's this hope that comes with it with uh, Boise State um, and their graduation, which is this Saturday. So. Uh, congrats to almost 3,000 students, I think I read, graduating this Saturday on the blue turf outside, mm -hmm. <laughs> which they've been having the uh, the commencement and the spring commencements outside since uh, COVID. And I guess they're continuing that tradition this year. Um, it is a little, a little less, uh, slightly fewer people are graduating this year than last spring, which was the largest class right. ever. Um, and you actually interviewed one of the students who's graduating uh, and who has like a very hopeful and sweet story. Um, her name's Pangea Finn. Can you tell us a little bit about her story that's in the Hey Boise newsletter? Yeah, uh, Pangea is great. I mean, she's just pretty incredible. She kind of gives, you know, every now and then there's just like a teenager who comes along and just kind of like really gives you hope. Yeah. Um, and she's kind of one of those people to me, I think. Um, so she's 17. 17. <laughs> 17, and she is graduating this Saturday. Um, she was named one of the top 10 scholars 
um, Boise State, um, and she's graduating with two bachelor's degrees, one in math and physics and then one in music performance. And in the fall, she's headed to Harvard to enroll in their uh, PhD physics program. So yeah, she's pretty incredible. She um, just has a lot of love for Boise. And I think, you know, whenever like someone is that far in life at that age, it's always kind of like, oh, be careful. But she just seems to be like really like appreciating the ride. Um, Yeah, obviously, I don't want to speak for her, but she's just very much like I'm excited to go see what happens and just like learn more and get more involved and just kind of adventure. Um, And so, yeah, excited for her. Oh, so excited. Um, She also she was featured in uh, Boise State put together a new ad campaign, like a new commercial. And she was featured in it, which um, is very sweet because she's like playing piano in it. And so cool to see that uh, she's getting that shine. Um, I have to ask, you were in that record breaking class last year Mm -hmm. uh, when you graduated. And then like three days later, I think. Yep. (laughs) You started <laughs> not even two, 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 because yeah. it was Saturday, Saturday yeah. yeah, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. You sign in uh, for your first day at uh, CityCast Boise, and as our Hey Boise newsletter editor. Oh my God, Blake! <laughs> I really cannot believe it. I think if I think about it a little too deeply, I might have a bit of a crisis that it was a year ago. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, just like personally, what a, what a fun year! Like what a wild year! I feel a little envious that it's not supposed to hail on Saturday. <laughs> Right, right. Um, because last year that was, was rough, wasn't horrible. it? <laughs> um, it was just miserable. Um, but yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, it's exciting. I, if, if I can pass on some advice, I would just say, uh, don't start your job the Monday after you graduate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fine. It worked out better. Honestly, I would have just sat around like twiddling my thumbs. So it worked out. I remember though, when you, I was like, are you sure? Yeah, I, I know. Bad. You told me, you were like, hey. <laughs> Listen up. You should maybe take some time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, okay, I have to ask this. So, yeah, you you graduated and you could have gone anywhere. You could have moved on. Um, what's it like, though? Why, why did you stay in Boise? And what is it like to be, you know, uh, a young person, a young professional uh, starting your career in this in this city? Does it feel how's it feel? Um. You know, it's interesting. I think it's I, I chose to stay in Boise because I believe that Boise can be like a really interesting kind of blueprint for the future as far as like just where we are politically, um, environmentally. Um, and, you know, as far as like the city itself, it's mostly pretty welcoming. Um, I've had like a great experience like through work and like everyone's just like been very kind to me for the most part. Um but it's yeah, it's it's interesting. I think it's like it's hard to be a professional or like have a career in general right now, um, especially post pandemic. Like, um, but yeah, it, it's kind of hard to just like stay focused on things when it's just like you look at your phone and it's like, well, this happened or like, <laughs> another historic event. Yeah, yes. the world's yes. burning again, um, and so that can be difficult. But I also like I want to stay because I you know. I think that there is a a growing group of like young people in Boise who want to stay to like try to make a difference and just be like, well, we got to try somewhere. We got to try to like build a community and make changes and we're already here. Might as well be here kind of thing. Yeah. Well, as your elder millennial boss, I'm (laughs) so grateful that you stayed and uh, grateful that you uh, graduated Boise State a year ago so that you could join us. And um, yeah, Blake, uh, thanks so much for for helping me break down the news this week. And uh, congrats to all the, the new grads out there. Yeah, congrats, everyone. Thank you. Happy Friday. Okay, that's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show's produced by host Emma Arnold, Evelyn Avitia, and me, Frankie Barnhill. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and our music is by local band Up Is The Down Is The. Have you followed us on Instagram yet? Right now we're playing a Boise edition of Would You Rather, and we have exclusive backstage picks from our event last Friday, so check it out. We'll be back in this feed on Monday with more stories from around the city. See you then.